Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, uh, you know, we just have such a large number of dealerships where we've got all their repair order data. Sure. Uh, so, so nobody else can come close to that kind of, uh, that kind of analysis, but uh, it's good. You know, the industry is progressing. It's, it's, uh, you know, it, it's what the future needs for us to keep growing. And of course, you know, as we listen to these manufacturers talking about the, the EV revolution and, and what, uh, what that's going to mean to dealerships in the future, fixed ops becomes so much uh, more important because uh, each visit is going to be that much more critical because the future is vehicles will come in less often. And, uh, you know, certainly they could be more expensive to repair, but we're going to see them less often. And so, uh, you know, we, we've, we've really got to be gearing up going forward. How far away do you think we are from uh... A significant uh, bump. In that, in <laughs> not that not far enough, Ted. Not <laughs> far enough. <laughs> uh, every dealer I've spoken to, uh, you know, they're very positive, uh, but but there's that you can you can hear that that kind of fear in the back of their minds that uh, you know what is this really going to mean for my business? Right, right. And, and but I hear fixed tops directors now talking about it that it's really going to happen, okay? And that they really need to start gearing up and preparing for it. And we've been thinking about doing a whole segment or a number of segments on the EV front, okay, in our in our next event. So uh, I think it's I think it's on the forefront. I think it's I think it's coming probably sooner than maybe even we expect. You know, as an industry, we've we've done a terrible mm -hmm. job of being proactive. We've done a, a you know, we we do a, a pretty decent job of being reactive. This is one where if we're not proactive as dealers, there's going to be a terrible price to pay. And so, so you're right. Uh, you know, they are, they are looking at it and they are acknowledging it. Um, you know, that's the first, that's the first psychological step, right? You know, mm -hmm. the next one will be anger and then, we, and then we can move on to doing, doing the things that we need to do. Those are probably the right steps. Yes. Yeah, right. I, think, I think they apply here as well. Um, right. Okay, so uh, looking forward um, for the next six months, fixed operations uh, continuing to run hot and heavy. What do you think in, in dealerships? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, um, you know, as people are getting out, they're going to start miling up their cars again. Cars that have not been serviced over the last year because they've been sitting are going to need to be serviced. Listen, even if if you didn't put any miles on your car, that oil's been sitting for a year. You're not really going anywhere. Everybody's got to start getting their cars back into the shop. So. So, you know, we're going to see good RO counts. And then, of course, it's up to the dealer whether those RO counts turn into RO revenue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a focus on all the other things that go along with that, the tires and the alignments and the, sure. and the bread and butter and the, and the basics that really fixed operations delivers. And, uh, you know, regardless of whether uh, sales continues and at some point, you know, sales is going to have to go to work again on, on, uh, on you know, and the time to put the, the, the roof on the house is when the sun is shining, Fred. So I guess that's now and to right. start preparing. And that's you right. need to prepare in fixed operations as well, you know, as well to get better and uh, to prepare for what's coming. You know, back in the day when I, when I, was, when I had ASR Pro and mm -hmm. Toyota had that giant recall back in 09, whatever year it was, you know, I remember going to Toyota stores and saying, if you're not doing a great MPI now, you're wasting so much opportunity. These vehicles are coming in. It, it, it's paid for. You got the opportunity. Spend that five, six minutes. Do a great inspection and find the works that you, you, you have that customer pay attached to it. And this is very much going to be like that. Your RO counts are going to swell because people are now free to bring their cars in. And, you know, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do it right. So, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do a commercial for uh, all of the products that, that, you know, help you enhance your inspection process. Now's the time to be involved in, and do that. A lot of the young people in the business may not know that Fred Forden is the father of the a ASR uh, Pro process. And uh, you've uh, spent a big chunk of your life in, in getting that to market. So uh, my, again, my hat's off to you on that as well. You, you've really changed our business for the better in many ways. Thank you, Ted, thank you. Fred Forden here today from CDK Global at the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Thanks, Ted. Great to see you.
It's always great to hear from Fred Florden. And now entering the matrix to free more minds and potentially providing information that would have caused Neo to take the blue pill is the busting warranty myths panel. Gene, we've got an executive panel here today of leaders in our industry and uh, moderated by none other than Jim Roche, the founder and executive chairman of WarCloud. Jim, welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Thanks, Ted. As always, it's an honor to be here. Uh, and hello, everybody. Uh, we do have an excellent panel today to talk about busting some warranty myths. Uh, of course, everyone knows Tully Williams. Tully is the service leader at the Nilo Group in California, Nine Rooftops. Also joining is William Demery. Bill is the service leader at the Tom Wood Group, uh, 13 Rooftops. And last but certainly not least, Justin Pomeroy of the Foundation Group, uh, 22 Rooftops. Thanks all for being here. Um, we did a segment on the last Fixed Ops Roundtable, and I'd like to update some numbers as well as bring anyone who wasn't on that session up to speed. So I'm going to share some slides. So let's talk about turbocharging your service growth. Let's start with the variable side of the house. Uh, the latest estimates I saw were that um, in 2021, uh, we can expect to sell about 16.1 million new. Um, and while that's uh, great, that's a far cry from the 17 million we've all come to know and love. Maybe more interestingly, uh, once the chip shortage um, clears up, we're gonna be back to the longer term trends. What you're looking at, uh, friends from, from our friends at V Auto, are the gross margin trends for new vehicle sales and used vehicle sales. And essentially, we're gonna be selling fewer of items that it's gonna be harder and harder to make money on, which is a tough business model. And that explains why, uh, according to NADA, for the first time in over 40 years, service drove more than 50% of total dealership gross in 2019, 50.2% to be exact. But let's take a little bit of a closer look at service growth, service growth through 2020. Um, and that's a little bit tongue in cheek because what growth? Uh, according to NADA, if you look uh, at all dealers in the United States, Service overall was down, warranty was down, customer pay was down. Probably not surprising given the conditions we were all dealing with. In particular, customer pay has a troubling growth trend. Uh, if we look back in 2015, customer pay growth was about 2.9%. Uh, and you've got this interesting inverted V. Uh, at 2019, we had fallen to 1.3%. And then in 2020, we went negative. The peak of the inverted V driven by probably Takata and other large recalls. The trend seems to be that people had to come to the dealership uh, and then they didn't return. Offsetting that is the growth in warranty. The five-year growth in warranty is 38.2%. That worked out to be an average of about 7% per year. So what we can take away from this, number one, we know that service is the new growth driver for the dealership. And nothing wrong with that, that's fantastic. Um, and warranty, it really is, has been the growth engine for the service department. So the first question for our panel, uh, it will be, uh, will warranty revenue increase or decrease in the next five years and why? Well, before we get to the panel, we did some market research. We went out and talked to dealers and what you said is that we believe a processing warranty claims will be stable or we expect it to grow. Only 8% of franchise dealerships expects the volume of warranty claims to drop in the future. We believe that we'll see continued growth of 35.6% through the end of 2025. Three primary reasons driving that. One, we're gonna to continue to put more technology in vehicles as we go down this path to autonomous driving. Two, we believe that the manufacturers will lengthen warranty coverage. Autonomous vehicles will be driven more miles and they'll be more expensive. And three, you can petition uh, to the manufacturer, depending on the state you're in, uh, to analyze and then increase your parts markup and or your hourly labor rate. These three things, along with other factors, we think will drive up warranty growth. Um, in, interestingly, including through 2020, if you look at the size, the average size of the warranty RO, it increased over 15% from 2019 to 2020, from $344 an RO to 396. 
that's a six year growth of over 72%. So that's an interesting data point that even besides the pandemic, we're seeing a ramp up. We'll pause uh, and I'll turn to our panel. Uh, Tully, what do you think is gonna happen with warranty in the next five years? I think that the warranty rate will increase. I agree with what you found out with your stats. I think that we, you know, we are in the, the Neo company and the luxury models is that those models there demand excellence. They also demand service. And I think the manufacturers are more believing if we're gonna tie them into that brand or that model, we must make sure that one, is that their warranty is long enough for almost the life cycle of the car. Two, is that their maintenance is usually provided by the manufacturer, right? And I think that when we see that competition in this market, is you're gonna see manufacturers get even more strengthened about getting those warranties longer, right? Two, making sure the maintenance is paid for so we tie them back to the dealer because we are what? Truly in the repeat referral business and drive them to buy their next car. And leases are getting more popular. Leases are gonna drive the same thing. Leases are gonna keep the car under warranty, bring it back and get another one. So I believe that I am bullish on the warranty. Thank you, Tully. Bill, what say you? Agree, disagree? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, in our market, we're up about 42% on warranty. And I think that number is going to continue because wow. of the, the, the highline vehicles, especially the electronics, the computers that are in these cars today, the diagnostics it takes to diagnose the problems and get into the electronics is, is far more than what it used to be on changing an old nader and a starter. So I think that the manufacturers are going to continue with warranty labor rate increases, our parts increases, the dollar value of these tickets are gonna to continue to go up. And I think the volume of the warranty is just gonna continue driving. Uh, autonomous vehicles and the electric vehicles, that technology is, the cars are a lot heavier, tires, brakes are gonna wear out, suspension is gonna wear out a little bit quicker than what these vehicles used to. So I think we're gonna continue seeing a growth. And do you agree that the you, you can see the manufacturers lengthening the basic warranty period? I believe they will because of the competition of the vehicles. They're going to continue to increase the, the maintenance to drive them back to our store so we can sell the next vehicle, as Tully said. Great. Thank you. Justin, what do you think? I'm on board with what everyone else is saying. I mean, <clears throat> whether it's the OE or a third party or something of that sort, um, then with foundation, with all of our vehicles have warranty for life on you know the entire powertrain. Um, so whether it's the OE providing it or something or so, you know something else that the dealer provides them uh, with the purchase of the vehicle, it's 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 getting the customer back. Um, technicians are not getting any cheaper. Um, they know their value and they know what they're worth. And so with that comes, you know, a drive and door rate so that we can afford them and so that we can stay profitable. Um, it's, uh, they're not getting any cheaper, uh, the vehicles themselves. And so, yes, the quality is up across the board. Um, you have driving generators now uh, with the Ford Power Boost. And so with that comes a 100,000 mile warranty and, and they're having to increase these things, you know, for, for those buyers that are a little bit weary of the new technology, right? Um, so entirely, yes, um, that this will increase perpetually forever. And, and, you know, as long as we, we're continuing to increase the, the quality of the cars, the electric cars and so on and so forth. I agree entirely. You know, I saw recently that Rivian announced their warranty and their bumper to bumper is five years, 60,000 miles. So you all mentioned competitive pressure. I think that's the first shot across the bow. Um, that'll probably pull up the high lines of the premiums, but everybody will follow suit to one degree or another. Our second question. So I've been talking to a lot of dealerships lately about warranty. And one thing that I've noticed is a, a higher number than I expected dealers use their techs to help flag warranty. They don't do it end to end, but they do some of the booking. Um, and this, I, I, I want to ask the panel, um, should text be used to help flag warranty? Uh, Tully, what do you think? Absolutely not. Um, I think that a good Don't warranty, sugarcoat it now. Come on, tell, <laughs> us, not gonna. tell us where you're at. I think the, you know, if the manufacturer demands that, as in Porsche does, Porsche has this little thing about the tech needs to start the claim, but not finish the claim. But all of our other manufacturers, I want my technicians generating. Remember, if we look at what they generate per hour, at my store, it's $165 gross 
part and labor per hour. Why would I want to pay one even one tenth of one tenth of a day to a technician where I can have him producing and working on customers' cars and making people happy? Secondly, I think technicians are going to say, why am I doing this paperwork? And they're probably not going to do that quality of a job where a warranty admin is fully job. And I'm going to say, with even with a program like yours that helps our warranty admins even be better to make sure we maximize every dollar we can get from the factory. We do not want to oversubmit, but I surely don't want to undersubmit as well. Well, Tully and I had talked about this philosophically previously, so I was I was laying in the weeds waiting for him, but I did do a slide uh, based on NADA averages. Uh, per NADA, the 2020 guide, the average service operation has 15 techs, a labor rate of $130 an hour. That's 15,600 billable hours per day. Um, if your techs spend nine minutes per hour flagging a tickets, that's 2,300 and change a day, almost 12,000 a week, and over $600,000 a year in lost billable hours, to go to your point. Tully, so you're at 165 an hour, so it's even higher. So I, I, let me clarify that is that I'm talking about gross profit, parts, and labor. You're looking at a sales number. Sales is a made-up number. But when we all look at the gross profit per hour, parts and labor gross, the actual hits the financial statement. We're at 165 parts and labor gross. It even gets even a crazier number when it talks about real dollars to the financial statement. Bill, what do you think? I am a, I am in agreement. It's absolutely not. Um, our producers are in the shop. The only thing we have and fixed is to sell hours and parts. And if we're going to tie these guys up, uh, flagging uh, tickets and looking up warranty op codes, that's shutting the assembly line down. You you won't go into a car assembly line, pull the cord just because you must might have cleaned something up, and then he then he moves on. And, and I think it's the same thing. These are our producers. This is how we make money. This is the revenue generating guy back there. We need to deliver parts to these guys. We need to deliver hours to these guys and keep their bays full and, and, and keep them pumping out, out the back door. I would never want to do that. Justin, where do you sit with this one? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm following suit. Uh, when you when you get as granular in the hours is what the, what every taking a second that a technician is worth in parts and labor sales. Um, it's it behooves you for them to be turning wrenches. It's no, there's no reason for them to do anything other than that, other than cause complaint correction. Um, their job is to be, you know, in that bay and 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 doing their their deal. Um, secondly, I think that you kind of open yourself up for uh, some upsetting times during a warranty audit. God love them, uh, but they're technicians, you know. Uh, they they a little rough around the edges, and so that is what it is. And so, I I would rather have someone dedicated to do that entirely. It's it's someone else's deal. Right. Uh, it, it is it is perplexing to me. And maybe I mean, I, I don't have I haven't talked to everybody in the industry, obviously. But the people I've talked to over the last six, eight months, it seems like about 17 or 18 percent of the people I talk to have their techs doing some of this. And it's not as the as Tully mentioned, you know, where the manufacturer requires it is an example with Porsche. It's just that, hey, you know, we're we're cutting a corner here or, um, uh, you know, it's uh, it, you know, it helps us keep our warranty processing costs under control. But, you know, to save how much. Uh, so sounds like uh, if you're out there, we're not trying to um, uh, to criticize if this is a practice of yours, but you might want to double uh, rethink that a little bit. Hey, Jim, can I, can I just follow up with that real quick? Of course. I, did, I did a facility study on available space in an average store. And if you really look at all the space available that you can generate hours in, you'll realize you're using about 35, 40% of the, the actual space that you have in a shop already. So to, to, again, it just kind of goes along with why would you want to tie up the guy when you really need more guys in that shop to fill up that space? When you do a, a facilities analysis of space, space utilization of hours that could be turned, it would just blow your mind. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think it, we're just we're just bolding and and underscoring the point um, that I don't think any any of us, at least on this panel, could recommend it as a best practice. And if you're if you are doing it, it's a hidden cost. Uh, in two ways. Uh, one, it's additive to the cost of what your true warranty processing uh, costs are, but it's also costing you in the opportunity side. So our third panel question is, 
What do you estimate the cost of warranty processing is as a percentage of the warranty RO itself? Um, this one is really plot problematic. I don't know uh, how many of you out there have done this analysis, but we did do some market research at WarCloud. Interesting, uh, what did dealers say we spoke to? They said unaided, they anticipate that the average cost is about 6.1% of the dollar amount of the warranty RO, um, which if you com compare that to other claims processing industries, they are a fraction of where we are, but 6.1% is what dealers said. Um, why is it that? Well, again, our market research, uh, on average, dealers said there are about 1.6 employees in total responsible for warranty claim submission. Obviously, you can't have a fractional person, so it's distributed amongst another. And we also asked, if you look there in the middle, about how many minutes does it take to process, a, a, on average, a warranty claim? And the answer across the board from dealers was about 11 minutes. And 1.6 and 11 minutes, that drives up. Processing warranty claims, dealers spent about $1.6 billion last year in the aggregate. This is War Cloud's analysis. And we came up to 6.1% of the RO value. So dead on, the dealers, unaided, we weren't leading them in our market research, came to the same uh, conclusion that we did. Why? It's because it's there's no technology and primarily it's people. People are expensive. 1.6 FTEs and 11 minutes per claim. Um, and I wonder if it's a disappearing skill set, frankly. Um, but let's come back to that in a second. Uh, I'm going to go to the previous slide. Um, Kelly, what do you think? What do, you, do you have any sense of what your cost is? I know you're in California and labor costs or employee costs are a little higher. Well, I, 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 I've never done this analysis, but, you know, looking at it, you know, it's, it's kind of easy. You just, you know, wages plus a little extra divided by the warranty claim. But remember, we also need to include parts in this as well, not just labor because they were submitting both sides. But I think that having a human submit our claims is well money well spent it's almost like you know i don't want to pay the technician that much either but yet he's the wicked wrenches that are making it happen every day so when i look at we want to get our qualities worth and i love what you said is that we don't have technology today to help these hard men and women working to make our claims for us is that you know a program like yourselves is the one that's going to help them do the easy stuff because we want them to spend the time on the hard claims. How do we get that extra 10th? How do we get those other labor hours on ROs that are struggle and make sure that when we go through an audit, that it is a clean audit? You know, we want to make sure we get all the money we can to support our technicians. And I think having great programs to help us with the easy, so then make sure that we get all the money on the hard ones. Bill, what do you? What's your reaction to, on average, 1.6 full timers and 11 minutes per claim, and the the overall 6.1 percent of the the RO? Yeah, I think it's an interesting uh, equation, and I think it's something I've never really looked at. Um, and it, it should be no different than we we calculate what's it cost to have a technician standing at a parts counter. So, I think it's the it's the same equation, and and I agree with what Tully said. If we can get um, an automated system that handles the easy stuff uh, and, and use our talent wisely on maybe the harder um, items. Anything in, in my world that I can switch to any AI technology, um, I am a huge fan of because if we can take the emotions and the, and the people uh, uh, decisions out of a process and just follow the process, um, I think we get better results. And I think the the and if you then you back into the equation of the cost and and not even just the labor costs and the parts and uh, the human capital and the benefits and oh I'm going to call in sick today or I'm going to be on vacation for the next week and you know all these other things that come into play and and then they come back and there's a stack of warranty claims just all on their desk and now they're going to be behind for two weeks. If you can eliminate a little bit of that and get the easy stuff out of the way, I think it makes life better for that person. And, and creates a little bit better quality of life in, in, the, in the position. Justin, what do you, what's your reaction to the 1.6, 11 minutes per claim, and on average 6.1% of the RO is consumed by the processing cost? Um, I guess 
my question would be, uh, what, is that including, you know, um, as far as technicians tagging and turning in cores and st stuff like that, um, things of that matter, um, as far as processing the warranty ticket itself, uh, we outsource the majority of ours um, to a, a third party company. And it's um, it's it's a little bit smaller uh, than that. It's, I think on a, per se, like a two hundred and fifty dollar claim, it's about a 60, 60 uh, cents spend. Um, so it's um I found, you know, with with the tumultuous up and downs and people and managing those people, um, we had we've in history had a little bit of an issue with our rapid growth with people not sticking um, during buy sells and stuff like that, just for whatever reason. So I think that every service manager or director should take a warranty class because you need somebody on the front side who's going to go to bat for you to make sure that you know um, you're not losing revenue and that this warranty company is not just you know basically their job is just make sure the ticket closes. It doesn't matter how many hours we get, you know? Um, so I, I think you have to have that to hold them accountable on the, on, on your end. But uh, if you can source that, I think it's very beneficial um, and, and it's cost safe, cost savings. Undoubtedly. And, and we believe that that is the trend, uh, both to outsourcing naturally um, uh, because you get away from the, the dependence on people um, but also that we've got to bring some technology to bear on this. It can't be uh, it can't be what's in people's heads. And part of part of the what we what we think is we wonder if warranty administration is a disappearing skill set. I mean, it's already hard enough to rec recruit the upcoming generations, the millennials and the Gen Zs, because they're all about using cool new technology. And I think we'd all agree that whatever technology is available, nobody's lining up to say, "I really want to use that green screen so I can push warranty to the factory." It relies too much on tribal knowledge. There's no technology. You have high turnover, and it's a primary point of failure, uh, typically in the dealership. And that creates a fundamental problem. If you think about our previous uh, comment, uh, I should say before I go on, and if you if you're not sure if it's a disappearing skill set, just go out to the job boards and look at how many ads are out there. Dealers looking for warranty administrators, um, and these are just this is just a subset of a of a couple of them. So the problem. It exists, and I think it's going to amplify as we go forward. Here's the here's the, the problem, the problematic intersection of these things. We think that we're going to see over an over 30 percent increase in warranty going forward. So you're going to have an increased warranty processing need, and that intersects with increasing warranty human resources. Um, so that's going to be a problem going forward. The, the demand for the, the need for processing is going to go up simultaneous for there being fewer and fewer people uh, to, to take it on. Um, so quick summary, um, we think that vehicle sales will be an unreliable profit contributor to the dealership. The service department is the new driver of dealer profitability, and you know, it's not to like about that. God bless America. Warranty is the new growth engine of service, but it is going to be critical to defend your warranty profit margins. Uh, Tully, any closing comments? It's interesting when you talk about margins. You know, I think that in California, we've been blessed that the law passed, uh, I think it was about two years ago, that we can go submit for customer pay rates for our warranty. And what happens now is that warranty is becoming the new thing. This like what you're talking about, is that we now we are managing, really are we managing our effective labor rate, repair customer pay because that is gonna help drive our warranty. So now we're looking at two things. We're looking at one, our customer pay repair rate, because that's gonna trigger a warranty rate. And two is that, is our profit margins on parts set properly? Of course, we do not wanna overcharge anybody, but we wanna make sure we're at market rates. So now we have two things to help drive warranty rates. CP repair helps us with warranty. I think another thing you brought up was the disappearing act of warranty admins. I think a warranty admin is harder than a tech to find. You have outside people like Justin uses that are stealing all of our warranty admins because they get to work from home at any time they want. I totally get it. And as I think that we look at how we can make people attractive into that market, programs like yourself with Warranty Cloud are going to help with that because we do need to have backups. And I'm sure Justin got himself in some hot water one day. He's like, no one showed up for work. I'm not getting no money done. I'm going, I'm going wholesale, right? And I tell you, yeah, you know, that's what happens. And we are working hard to cross train our personnel because I think with the group, I think we're building our own little panel there with that. And I think that, you know, we see some great things. I am bullish on warranty. Bill, any closing thoughts? 
Yeah, I agree. You know, our labor costs are going to continue to, to go up. And we've looked at just in the last, you know, 8, 10, 12 months of what's happening on the labor costs and outsourcing. And did you know that if you drive through a fast fast food chain and you get up to the window and the person you talked to you thought was a female and the guy at the window is a male, how do they know I'm driving a black car? It's because they outsource it. So that person is working from home, taking your order from home and pushing it in the store. It's all outsourced. So it's interesting that so many markets are, are doing this. And we've been a little maybe uh, standoffish because we want control. We want those people in our stores and times have changed. And, and I think outsourcing is here. And I think working from home is a whole new thing that we better be open to uh, over the coming months, because uh, the labor the labor costs are just going to continue to go up, and what happens? We have to continue charging a little bit more. Yeah, that control and that uh, you know having them in the store is is getting more and more expensive. It's going to reach a breaking point. Justin, any final observations or thoughts? I'm 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 echoing Tully from the the rooftops. Um, we I just went in and, and got a an effective warranty rate that was higher than um, in a in a in, uh, import store than. It, my store down the street, which is a domestic store, had so it's it's all tit for tat, right? Um, so if this, then that with the OEs, and so for, to echo what he said, you set your part, the parts escalators correctly, and you you make sure that your effective labor rate is within you know a couple dollars of what your warranty labor rate is, and you and you push, and you make sure that you know when it comes time to pay the piper that you get that money. Um, so it's a uh, life was going to change and people got home and they got used to being home and they showed that their their bosses that look i can still do what i'm doing for you from right here on my sweet couch or lazy boy <laughs> uh and so if you're not going to let me do it guess what this company is offering me a pretty sweet deal making almost the same and i and i can sit here and pet my shih tzu and life is good i eat cheetos and um so yeah no it's it's i don't want to see them go away in the workplace i think they're an absolute necessity uh having a person to do it is sometimes better but we all know at the end of the month you got twenty thousand dollars in warranty to get closed they're going to be there bell to bell and sometimes even after that and that gets really stressful for a person so um no i i think that it's it's going in the direction where everything will be outsourced uh eventually in some way shape or form um i, I ordered pizza hut the other day i shouldn't have but uh yeah it was a bank uh, and they said well, what store do you want to go to i was, thought i was talking to the store i'm sorry um but yes it's 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 going in a, a, a weird direction and but all the same it's it's it will be a very vital part in our business for a very long time well, you know, typically outsourcing, um, you get faster, better, cheaper. And the last time I checked, no one ever got fired for faster, better, cheaper, right? So uh, seems to be the wave of the future. I just want to take a quick second um, and say thank you to our panel. Everybody who's attending this conference knows how busy service leaders are and the pressures. Uh, and for these guys to take time out of their busy days to come here and share their experience and their knowledge is invaluable. So thank you, Tully. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Justin. That was great feedback. And thank you, Jim Roche of WarCloud. The exceptional panel once again, and such eye-opening information from all of you. So thank you for sharing that today, and thank you for being a part of this conference today. Uh, Jim, once again, my hat's off to you. Great job and uh, great topic. And uh, we hope to see you back again. Hope to see all of you. We will see all of you back again. What am I saying? So great job, Jim Roche and the panel here today at the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Thank you, Ted. Hey, great information, gentlemen. Dale Pollock and Brian Benstock are just ahead. But first, Anthony Montero of Draper, right after this. In today's market, new vehicle sales have declined from the previous average of 17 million units to an estimated 15 and a half million in 2021. To make matters worse, you're making even less profit per unit. The long-term depression means that you'll be selling fewer vehicles and making less money per sale. That's why your service department will be the primary driver of your gross profit in the future. In fact, in 2019, service contributed over 50% of total dealership gross profit. Warranty is an important and growing part of your service profit. Warranty has increased 38.3% over the last five years. 
That's an average of 7.7% per year. By far the fastest growing segment of your service business. Protecting your warranty and service gross margins is critical. But your warranty processing costs have also risen and if left unchecked will continue to do so. That means your fastest growing profit driver is also at risk due to rising costs. Reduce your expenses and defend your gross profit with WarCloud, the technology service that greatly improves your warranty processing. WarCloud technology automates warranty processing so you don't have to do it anymore. With end-to-end -end warranty claims management that also includes closing the repair order, paying your tax, DMS integration, monitoring for OEM payment, and much more. By using WarCloud, you can also eliminate errors before they cause delays, speed claims, reduce costs, and maximize reimbursements. Dealers using WarCloud are seeing impressive results. They've been able to reduce warranty processing costs by more than 60%, giving a big boost to your gross profit. Plus, they've seen up to 10% increase in claim reimbursements and are able to process claims up to five times faster. This gives your service leaders back more time each day to spend with your customers and improve retention. Meet the future of warranty processing and get these kinds of results for your dealership. Request a free, no obligation analysis today to see how much better you can be with WarCloud. Companies across diverse industries conduct a lot of vehicle moves every day. But are you tracking the efficiency and cost of these moves? The level of time and planning, or lack thereof, going into them? Many businesses actually fail to track vehicle movement costs, and that leads them to encouraging, whether they know it or not, wasteful uses of time and money. This is where Draver comes in. We move vehicles daily, at any scale, from local to international, empowered by our AI logistics platform. When it comes to vehicle movement, Draver takes all the heavy lifting off your staff. Your employees are tasked with moving vehicles, people and packages every day. Draver's simple web interface makes it easy for your people to track and control the chaos. Then, our drivers get minute-by-minute -minute instructions via the app, making sure everyone is on the same page. The Draver platform matches pickup and delivery tasks with drivers and then coordinates drivers to trips. It adds efficient logistics to your operation. Our platform constantly optimizes routes, termination points to origination points, and rideshare versus chase decisions. In practice, it eliminates the need for a chase vehicle over 40% of the time, saving your business time and money. To keep your operation consistently staffed, Draver can predict workforce shortages against daily demand and find insured, vetted drivers ASAP. Best of all, Draver is flexible with your infrastructure. It seamlessly integrates with your software and processes, so you don't have to change a thing. You can use the platform to optimize your existing operations. You can take advantage of Draver's network of drivers, or you can use a combination of both. We make it easy for any business to move vehicles. Whether it's one truck, hundreds of cars, or a thousand semis, our online platform does it all for you. Sign up today and we will waive all setup fees and we'll credit your account with $200 for free moves. Welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable, and it is a great pleasure to welcome Anthony Montero, the Chief Operating Officer of Draver. Anthony, welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Ted, great to be back, man. I, I really enjoy doing these sessions. And, you know, last time I was with Big A, and for some reason, everybody calls me Big A now, and I have no idea why, but apparently <laughs> there's some similarities there. So a pleasure to be back, man. Yeah, Anthony, this time we've got you in the matrix. So, and so much has happened in the last two months since we got together. So I want to talk to you about that. Among those things is that Draver has now become the preeminent service pickup and delivery solution for retail dealers. Congratulations on all your hard work and all the success that you're having. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, it's been quite a ride, I'll tell you and the partnerships that we've been able to make with 
with the nation's biggest service scheduling and service operations companies is, is just amazing for us. And we're just having, you know, the cool thing about innovation and, and breaking through with, with great ideas and technology is you have fun, man. People are just enjoying it and our clients are loving it and their customers are just loving it. And, uh, you know, it's a fun time. It really is. Uh, you're doing the right thing at the right time. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about that because the logistics that you do, not everybody can pull that off. Very, very few people can do that even and do it effectively, let alone. Um, talk to me about how you got in this space real quick. And then let's talk about what you're doing now and where we're going into the future. Sure. Well, we got into this to solve a problem. Uh, I had built a digital retailing tool um, at, at eLead. And the problem was everybody was trying to create this Carvana world of put a, put a vehicle in a shopping cart and add some stuff to your shopping cart, get approved, and all of a sudden magically cars show up in your driveway. There's a massive process of disconnect at the dealership level to be able to pull that off from not only from logistics, but from processes of how they operate and, and what they do. So, you know, when when CDK came in and bought eLead, I ventured off and, and met a partner of mine that uh, we put together the Draver product, which was already moving in the fleet business because fleet companies and rental car companies move vehicles at scale and they need humans to drive them because they don't have time to wait for a truck to show up and load it up and get that load board process done. They need a, they need 12 vehicles across town in 10 minutes or an hour. So they need it quick. They need it fast because otherwise their business suffers. So we got really good at it. And we've, uh, we've been in automotive because autom automotive retail is just another expansion of, hey, I need to move a vehicle from point A to point B or C to D. And we have the logistics and the manpower to do that with, with our customers. And you've got the technology, Anthony, at Draver. You really do. Let's talk a little bit about this service concierge that customers can order and doing the whole thing online. How do you, how do, you do that? Well, so we partnered with some some really cool companies and there'll be press releases and you'll hear a lot about all these things coming soon. Right. But it's you know, when you go to ser schedule service, pickup and delivery is really a transportation type if you think about it. So there's some questions in that online schedule that says, are you dropping the car off? Are you a waiter? Do you need a ride? And will you be selecting our, you know, shuttle service or um, do you qualify? Some of these products have the ability to qualify based on type of job or customer loyalty or time of day or brand of car, all these things. So it's just another um, selection of transportation type. In the past, people and humans would have to manage all of that, right? They'd have to say, oh, I've got five pickup and deliveries. I need to call Bob and Pete and Joe and get them to come and pick it up and get my loaner car. Well, this is fully integrated and we get the order. We coordinate it with the loaner car software. So we say, hey, there's a loaner car available. This service qualifies. Schedule that service pickup and delivery. And guess what? The dealership doesn't really have to do anything other than hand over the keys to that loaner car when the, when the driver gets there. And the customer doesn't have to do anything because we'll notify them with the app of the drivers coming down the road, kind of like DoorDash, and they swap keys and guess what? The customer is completely happy, their car gets serviced and, they, and, and it comes back to them when it's done. I would imagine there's, there's no, if any at all, pushback from a consumer because of the convenience. And like you just said, they already experienced this kind of technology, you know, when they order from their local restaurant or, you know, uh, other services as well. So how do you integrate all the, how have you integrated all these things and how does that work? Well, it's, you know, in the technology world, it's the APIs, right? So if, if you've got powerful APIs, that can talk to somebody else's software and their software can talk to yours. And sometimes it might be three or four different companies all doing this coordination through APIs. That's how it happens. And, and you know, it's, it's really magic when it comes to that point because you are, you know, eliminating 
the manual input of a lot of things and, the, uh, and a lot of the manual processes that go into this that do put the brakes on it because what dealers are busy and they've got a lot of things going on the last thing they really need is this whole new, hey, I got to go load up some system. I got to coordinate it with my scheduler. I got to find a driver. It really puts a burden on them. And when we come in and install our software and our processes, it, it, it's a home run for them. And it makes it a great experience for their customers, which just drives their CSI through the roof. Okay, so let's talk about that. What are some of the benefits for the dealer? The increased CSI. Uh, Brian Benstock, who's appeared on here a number of times, uh, and started pick up a service pickup and delivery a couple of years ago, said that his profits continue to be higher. And he's coming up next uh, in the Fixed Ops Roundtable. So what are some of the benefits for the dealer? Yeah, Brian's awesome. Can't wait to see that session. Um, so yeah, listen, if you've got their car there all day long and they came in for an oil change and maybe a tire rotation and they need brakes or a 60K, guess what? They're more likely to say yes, right? They're not sitting in your waiting room twiddling their thumbs going, when's my car gonna be ready? I got have to go somewhere. They, they either have an alternate transportation or they've already committed that they're gonna have their car gone for the day. The other thing is, which is really cool, Ted, the progressive dealers are tying in their sales department to this. They're saying, hey, let me look. You know, back in the old days, we used to do this with a little whiteboard and say all the cars that are coming in, we want to swap them out and trade, right? And then we built something back in the Ely days that, that did data mining. Well, what I've been suggesting and we're working with our dealers is take your data mining tool, identify all your service appointments that are coming in over the next few days and offer them concierge service. Now you've solved your loaner car problem because you're taking that new car and saying, hey, Mr. Customer, I'm going to bring you a brand new car and I might be able to swap you out of this for an equal or, or lower payment. While your vehicle's here, we're going to fix it, but we're also going to appraise it and your sales associate is going to be in touch with you and, and maybe we can swap your car out because we all know that acquiring used cars is probably one of the hardest things to do right now. And this just is, you know, think about it. Not only am I giving this really cool concierge service, but I'm also taking in or having the ability to take in these used cars right in my service lane. You're so far ahead of anybody else who's in this field at Draver. Um, let's talk a little bit about that because used car values right now are at an historic high and they've been going up all year. So talk to me just a little bit more about that because a great place to get those and buy those used cars is right on my service drive without having to go to the auction. Or someone else's service drive, right? So. Think about everybody that's coming into service that Goodyear or Jiffy Lube or all of these third party places. There's organizations and companies that are way out on the on the front end, front end of this that are that have people standing in those lanes trying to acquire those vehicles while the customers are getting their vehicle serviced. And guess what they are and what what they're using us for is once they make that transaction, our driver in there to acquire those keys maybe bring the customer uh, or bring them home via our Uber integration and and or bring them right to a dealership where they have partnerships with these dealerships or the dealerships are the ones running these programs. And this vehicle acquisition model is really, really big, Ted. I mean, it's amazing the number of moves that we do every day in vehicle acquisition now. How about the old school dealer who says, you know, they, they've been using their people and they use them for other things along the way and the, you know, porters and valets and that thing. I think you had one at the, on the last Fix Ops round table. Big uh, A. I, that yeah, was how, how'd you make out with Big A? So, hey, listen, Big A loves us now, right? Big A is doing service lane mining. Big A has got all of his customers with uh, vehicles in their hands when they want to get serviced. Big A is doing all of his dealer swaps and his sister store swaps on our platform. And we still use Big A's quarters. All they do is load our app on their phone. And when they go move a car, they scan it and move it. So now we're able to tell Big A and his team where that car went, who drove it, how fast they went, if they, if they didn't stay on track, if they went through tolls, all these things that, you know, we're in a service fixed ops roundtable session here. And we all know that we measure everything, dollars per RO and turn and all, all these things we measure to the micro minutia. We measure your vehicle movement, 
your people movement and and now parts and packages that's a whole nother that's probably a whole nother session we can get into about being able to get a part in your hands in 15 or 20 minutes when that car's still on the lift with a with a click of a button and here's the really cool thing that we've done ted some of these partnerships Traver's the button now that it's i need to move this car click i need my customer's car picked up click i need a part brought to me click because they already have all the information we know where the vehicle is. Well, it's at the dealership. We know the customer's address. We know their appointment time. We know that what type of service they're getting. So now all the advisor or the BDC agent has to do is, is choose concierge and it all happens behind the scenes and that car gets picked up and dropped off. That even sounds good, service concierge. <laughs> right? You're taking this to a whole new level, Anthony. Yeah, we're we're super excited. Our partners are are super excited, and and you know we've got so many more that you know every day it's amazing. The innovator, some some company will see like one of these sessions, or they'll hear about us through someone else or a twenty group, and they'll say, "Hey, we're doing this really cool thing with technology, either acquiring cars or reconditioning cars." Is another one, right? As all these people try to buy these cars. This, this process of reconditioning is really bubbled up with, with all the different software applications that are out there that, that speed that process up. But still at the end of the day, someone needs to drive the car to the recon center, someone needs to drive the car back to the retail uh, location and all of that logistics. What, you know, what good does it do if I sped my recon process up by a day and my car sits at my recon lot for two? You've you've completely wasted every single piece of efficiency that you got out of your recon software if you can't move the car under that front line. So you create efficiencies for dealers, mm -hmm. and um, is it expensive to to for a dealer to get involved with uh, with Draver, Anthony? I'll tell you what, it's expensive not to get involved because <laughs> you're listen, you're losing efficiencies if you don't, right? You know, I had a, it's funny, I had a dealer not too long ago say, hey, I only pay, and it wasn't Big A, it was another dealer, but he was similar to him. I only pay $13 an hour for my porters. I said, 13 bucks an hour. I said, well, first of all, that's kind of cheap, and I don't know how you keep porters at, at 13 bucks an hour in this world, but <laughs> even if you do, it's not, it's not 13. By the time you pay unemployment, social security, manager's cost to manage that employee, all of the the um people, other things like people vacation. call it people call in sick they have holidays yeah what do you do then right yeah. i've got five customers that expect their cars being picked up and dropped off and two of my porters go out sick what what do i do now right so this model the draver model of a burstable workforce that can meet your demands of your business is it only makes sense in today's world because you can grow really fast and God forbid another COVID hits us, you can scale back really quick without having all this fixed expense locked into your operation. That was just a discussion on a panel just a, a little bit earlier today uh, with Jim Roche's panel about how so much now is being outsourced that we don't even realize. And that creates, like you said, so many efficiencies as well. Anthony, how does a dealer get involved with Draver and learn more about what you do? It's simple, go to our website, Draver.com, D-R-A-I-V-E-R.com. Call us directly, 844-497-0791. One of our sales agents will pick it up, walk you through a demo. Um, listen, within the next couple of months, we're setting our website up so you can just simply go online and click and sign up and you don't even have to talk to us. So um, we're fully enabling our own technology so that anybody can sign up and try it out and start moving cars very easily even consumers if if you're in florida and you're going back north because you're you were on vacation well you just click 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 and we'll take your car wherever you need it to go and folks even big a signed up with draver so big a <laughs> that Good just shows you, that just shows you how far uh our industry has come uh anthony montero at Draver leading the way here today at the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Thank you guys, pleasure, pleasure as always. Thanks so much, Anthony. We love talking to you as well. And folks, stick around. Dale Pollock and Brian Benstock are just ahead.
Well, Ted, our next two guests were well worth waiting for. Both are industry innovators and top performing leaders, Dale Pollack and Brian Benstock. Gentlemen, welcome to the Fix Stops Roundtable. Thank you. Great to be with you. Super great to be here with my friend Dale Pollack and you, and you guys as well. Brian, thank you so much. Dale Pollack is V Auto's visionary founder and serves as executive vice president for Cox Automotive, a position he's held since V Auto became part of the Cox family. Uh, Dale has published several books uh, on his velocity method of management and remains one of the leading authorities on automotive dealership management strategies. And Brian Benstock is no stranger to this event as well. He is the partner GM and VP of Paragon Honda and Paragon Acura in Queens, New York. They are the number one certified Honda and Acura dealer globally. And last month, Brian's team delivered 825 new Hondas, an all-time high, and 320 certified pre-owned sales. Brian, welcome back to the Fix Ops Roundtable. Ted, it's really great to be here. That is a lot of Hondas and Acuras, Brian. Um, <laughs> you know, we've seen a lot in, in the last year. Um, you know, bring us up to speed. And, uh, you know, we want to talk a little bit about the state of the industry and uh, where we're headed uh, for the next uh, for the next six months or so. Well, I, I, I defer to my, my, my colleague, Dale Pollack, to start. I mean, he is, um, he's my, not only is, uh, he, I, do I consider him a colleague, but uh, he is a mentor to me. And so I, I want to let Mr. Pollock speak first. Well, thank you, Brian. And I can assure you and everyone else that the admiration is, is mutual. Um, Brian is uh, one of the most innovative, progressive, committed leaders that I've ever had the privilege to work with in the industry. So regarding the state of the industry in general, it's, it's been an extraordinary past year. Uh, in, in spite of the pandemic, um, there have been forces at work that have created some of the most favorable selling and profit conditions in my four decades of history, um, all fairly related to COVID. So I think it's fair to say that most all dealers have done exceptionally well from a volume and profit standpoint over uh, the past year. Uh, some dealers, however, have really excelled even beyond uh, the, 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 the new norm, Brian certainly being one of those. But it is also the case, as we can see in the data, which I look at on a daily basis from both the wholesale and the retail market, that the conditions that have been so favorable for dealers uh, for the past year are beginning to moderate. And I'm not in any way suggesting that uh, we see uh, any sort of abrupt, abrupt end or cliff to the good times that we've been experiencing, but nevertheless, the conditions are moderating. And it's fair to say that uh, most dealers do very well in stable environments, good or bad, but it's often the case as we are now entering where in, in periods of transition, it's often the case that uh, dealers uh, miss the opportunity to make necessary adjustments. And I think this is one of those critical periods of of moderation or transition between uh, one type of market and another, both being very favorable, but a transition nevertheless. Dale, you were quoted recently. Um, people were asking you, some dealers were asking about the current chip shortage and uh, you know new vehicle production levels and limited availability for uh, inventory. And uh, I, I recall that you responded, you said, from now on, when dealers ask me, when the chip shortage might end and new and used vehicle supplies will return to normal, I respond with a different question. Are you sure that's what you really want? <laughs> so I appreciate that very much. Right. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, there's some tongue in cheek in that response that you quoted, but it is true that the best possible selling environment for any retailer is to have exceptionally strong demand and, and limited uh, supply because that gives them a lot of pricing power, which is what has significantly contributed to dealer success over, over the past year. So um, it does also present some challenges, obviously. It's, it's frustrating to have to tell consumers that they can't necessarily get the car that they want or they're gonna have to wait for it. Uh, short supply and high demand puts an ever greater emphasis on the need to get cars reconditioned more quickly. 
And if there are constraints in a dealership's operations in that area, it creates a lot of frustration. So even though uh, this unusual condition creates a lot of operational challenges for dealers, it is nevertheless very favorable for, for, for them from a profit perspective. I think Dale's, Dale's spot on, I, you know, and I, and I think what the slowdown that Dale speaks of or the, or the leveling off that he speaks of, I think is due largely to the limitations on inventory. We've really hit rock bottom with some of the uh, OEMs. I'm uh, paid to be an optimist and I am an optimist. And I do think that this uh, is going to continue uh, for a while longer. I think Dale's again, right when he talks about transition and we're going to have a transition from a low day supply to uh, in August, an incredibly high day supply. I love both sides of that football. And I'm, we, we, we certainly love the conditions that we, as we find them right now, where the margins are, are continuing to increase. And Dale, we're seeing that in our market with our product, uh, that that is continuing right now. We are uh, climbing, still climbing right now in terms of both volume and profitability. Our particular stores are blessed to have a, a decent supply of inventory. So we're going to continue to try and over-index the, the current market that we're in. Uh, to Dale's other point of where de dealers can struggle, I think the, you know, the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. And right now, the sun has never been brighter on us. And, and that's why we're out with the hammer and nails and the, the shingles uh, repairing the roof, uh, cleaning up the balance sheets, you know, and making sure that we are ready for that transition. It's going to go to a, a, a more robust inventory level uh, uh, where the marketing skills and, and, and the ability to reach massive customers is going to play into a different, uh, you know, a, it's going to be a different hand for the dealers. Uh, right now, uh, I, I think you've got uh, a number of consumers that are coming out of this pandemic environment. I think those customers uh, want to get out. I think we've got uh, 1.7 trillion dollars in savings that was accumulated over the past 14 months. I think we're going to see that come into the economy, and I think that that bodes continue will continue to bode well for dealers. We also um, we're, they're, they're going to. Pour, uh, pass some form of additional stimulus that'll work its way into the economy. So, you know, I, I'm optimist, uh, optimistic about the next 12 months. I think while it will be different than it is now, while there will be a transition and inventory uh, will go from a scarce supply of inventory to a robust supply of inventory, certainly dealers can win in either environment. Dale, how do you feel about what Ryan just said, the next six to 12 months? Well, let me say that I've never gone to bed one night worried about Paragon Honda or Brian Benstock, because no matter what the conditions are, uh, Brian is going to find a way to either buck the trend or exceed the trend. So uh, while I appreciate the fact that Brian is experiencing uh, unprecedented demand and has optimism to see that going forward, and I have no doubt that he's right in the case of Paragon Honda, I, I would temper the industry at large to recognize the fact that um, we are now seeing the past year of wholesale appreciation begin to level off. Um, I watch these numbers every day, and there's no question about the fact that over the past four to six weeks, the rate of wholesale uh, appreciation, but appreciation has been narrowing virtually every week. Dale, and now is to a point where, go ahead. Dale, it had to, it had to. It was getting to the point where the wholesale value of used cars was approaching that of the value of new cars. You know, and and, and in some cases, I'm hearing that the value, the, the wholesale value of uh, pickup trucks in particular, uh, and, uh, the Ford trucks were actually selling for higher than the original MSRP of the vehicles. I mean, so so there's there's got to be some uh, rationale. Uh, that plays into this. And, you know, so, you know, it, it may be leveling off, but I, I think it's still leveling off uh, at a level that's, you know, very, very uh, favorable for dealers. Right. And, and again, it is leveling off and we expect it to plateau, but it is significant for dealers to recognize that it is at or very near the top. Yeah. And, I mean, and therefore, there, therefore my concern for, for dealers at large is that they're coming off that they're coming off of a series of months, April, May, perhaps March, that were extremely high volume, if not record months. So dealers are feeling feeling very 
very emboldened and, and, and enabled to sell cars. The demand for cars across the country, I can tell you, is beginning to wane. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it's falling drastically. It's just moderating. And we, do, we don't see anything in the future that would suggest it's going to fall off a cliff, but it is nevertheless moderating. So, so if you put those two pieces of information together, that demand is moderating and wholesale prices are at or near the top, the advice that I give to dealers is make sure you have enough inventory, but now in the late cycle of this wholesale appreciation would not necessarily be the wisest time to go out and buy all the cars you can, because if you did, and the demand over the course of the next three, four months doesn't match that of the past three or four months, you could find yourself in the late summer, early fall with a lot full of used cars that you bought at the top of the market. Yeah. And that's not necessarily where you wanna find yourself. So I'm only advising moderation, disciplined moderation in terms of stocking levels relative to your 30 day rolling sales volume. Yeah, Dale's advice is spot on. You know, I think we're looking at the inventory now every seven days. You don't want to get, uh, you don't want to be too long in a car right now because if, if that price changes, it's like a, a game of uh, musical chairs. You can find yourself without a chair underneath you and uh, taking some losses to get out of the cars. And I think that's another one of the concerns that some of these um, uh, th these markets can produce bad habits for dealers and you can be sloppy now and make money. And this is really a time to, I think, to, to tighten up the belt and make sure you're, you're, you're not getting careless with the numbers that you're putting on the car, that you really pay attention to these things. I mean, we're, we're making 2000 a car at the auction. You know, and I'm not talking about a few cars. I'm talking about over, you know, several hundred cars. It's ridiculous, and it's caused me to relook at the cars we're sending to the auction. And are we sending retailable cars to the auction? And my my gosh, as we look at the cars, we're not. We're sending cars that really don't meet the criteria that we have for selling the cars. Yet there's such a demand out there from uh, some of the big aggregators that can't manufacture used cars like we can uh, that they're buying this stuff. Lord knows where they're selling some of these cars. Lord knows. <laughs> Brian, how does this affect? So, so Brian, if it... go ahead, Dale. I'm sorry, Brian. If I could just if if I could just emphasize something that you just said, dealers. Uh, frequently ask me what I think is the greatest threat going forward. And, and my answer is, I believe the greatest threat to a dealer's success is the dealer themselves. Right. Because as Brian properly, note, in, as Brian properly noted, in times like the ones that we've experienced in the past year, it, it's, it's pretty true that a dealer could do no wrong. And in those conditions, it's awfully easy for a dealer to lose their discipline, lose their strategy, lose their commitment to process. So uh, this is what I fear might be happening at, at dealerships across the country. And as Brian said, he repairs the roof when the sun is shining. It is now when times are really good and success might come a bit easily. This is the time to really make sure that you're dialed in on your strategy, your discipline and your processes. So, Brian, I really appreciate uh, you bringing that point up because I think it's super important for dealers to recognize. Yeah, we're, we're, Dale, we're, we're keeping the rate of turn about where we always kept the rate. You know, we're, we're looking to turn the inventory. And, you know, a couple of my uh, guys in the store were saying, no, no, let's hold on to these cars a little longer. I think, I said, guys, we're going to get the margin. Keep the turn consistent. The grosses will be the variable. I don't want to start changing our strategy in terms of hanging on to cars. You know, the old saying, uh, fish and guests smell after three days. Well, you know, use cars, add used cars to that. After a couple of days, when they go beyond your limit, they start to smell. And I don't want to take the chance uh, of having cars uh, in inventory that we own wrong. And keep in mind, you know, some of the dealerships our size keep several hundred used cars. And if you're off by, uh, if all of a sudden that market shifts, that, that could be thousands or millions of dollars in that shift. And, and then you're chasing, you're chasing the, the car and, and trying to move the car and you know, distress selling. And, and you are not alone in doing that. There are another 30,000 new and used car dealers doing the same thing. So th that bottom can drop pretty quickly. So we're keeping a real uh, steady hand on the tiller and a close eye on, on that inventory. You gentlemen Perfect. are both very disciplined. Brian, I have to ask you on the retail side, how does uh, all this play into your service operation, into your service marketing, um, all the things that we're talking about now with inventory? Well, you know, the sales and service uh, team that we have, I, I think is second to none. I think 
the um, what they're able to do in that lane is to manufacture used cars for us. And, you know, and I say manufacture tongue in cheek, that we're able to select the cars that we are looking for on the used car lot and to target those cars, uh, driving them into the service department to service and then making them an offer. Uh, right now and, and and to acquire their car and, and the customers win you know several different ways you've got the lowest interest rates we've had in the history of uh, my, in my history um, you, you've got higher than normal used car rates so that's creating incredible value for many customers so it, it's something where it's win-win you drive the customers into the service department giving them an offer on service that makes really good sense and when they're there you can give the customer a proposal on, on their pre-owned cars and many customers are taking advantage of that which is enabling us to to keep our supply of used cars steady. Um, as you mentioned before, we had a, a good month in volume uh, for new cars, and that's been consistent for us. So our trade-ins and our uh, inventory of used cars has accordingly been consistent. And, you know, Dale said dealers thrive in consistency. And thankfully, we've been uh, blessed to have the consistency of the new car sales and, and the used car sales. And we, we got we got a little lucky in December and January and February. We, we thought that this chip shortage might impact us at Honda. And we, we were buying uh, as much inventory as we could uh, during those months, so much so that my floor plan banker called me and said, you know, you're approaching your limit on your line. And I, I asked him, uh, is that a problem? He said, no, I just want to make sure you were aware. I said, I'm aware, call me in two months. And uh, sure enough, in two months, he said, hey, uh, I get it now. Because, you know, that chip shortage that had at the time been hitting most of the domestics and Toyota did come over to the Honda side and it, and it put Paragon in a, in a pretty good position. Gentlemen, uh, both of you are uh, are game changers, and uh, you're not afraid to uh, stick your necks out to try something new. Uh, Brian, you started doing the service pickup and delivery before it was even sexy, and now uh, look how you know you were were so far ahead in in your thinking. It's um, still not sexy. It's still <laughs> not sexy. It's necessary, but it's not sexy. <laughs> um, Dale first, and then Brian. Uh, just uh, any uh, for our dealer audience, our general managers. Um, any uh, any other words of advice going into the rest of uh, 2021? Dale, you first. Well, I just want to say that it was probably close to 10 years ago that I took a trip, one of many trips, but it was 10 years ago that I took a trip out to Paragon Honda because I had heard that Brian Benstock had perfected a technique of, uh, of buying cars out of a service drive from service customers. And that was close to 10 years ago. And, and Brian was doing it at that time uh, for the opportunity that it presented. And today, I think it's fair to say that most every dealer has some effort uh, in terms of buying cars out or by acquiring cars out of their service drive out of necessity. So once again, Brian, I mean, you are the leader of identifying opportunity. And in this case, opportunity is translated into necessity. So I think that purchasing vehicles uh, in non-traditional manner um, is going to be very critical for dealer success going forward. There's going to be a shortage of late model used cars for years as a result of us losing all of last year and on our way to losing most, if not all, this year of commercial vehicle production that would otherwise have been built and gone into rental car service and dumped out onto auction yards across the country. Those cars are not being built. They're not being uh, used in service. And consequently, they won't appear in auction yards for years to come. So it's going to take a while for the supply chain of used vehicles, late model used vehicles to reconstitute itself. And, and late model used cars are ones that dealers uh, need desperately for their used car operations. So as Brian uh, recognized a decade ago and most every dealer subsequently, uh, we need to perfect uh, means of purchasing vehicles from consumers, whether it be in the service drive or off the street or in other non-traditional manner. Uh, Dale, I think you, you, know, you hit the nail on the head. And I think this is our edge right now over some of the big uh, aggregators that are out there, you know, that they, they don't necessarily have the ability to do this. And I, I think once again, this is an edge for the dealer uh, to go out and to acquire the cars that he or she wants directly from their own database. And, and you know, who knows if we get really good at that, who, who knows what, what the upside uh, there is. And I, I think the upside is pretty significant. Love it. Great information, gentlemen. 
two visionaries here today, Dale Pollack and Brian Benstock, here at the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Thank Dale, you, John. Dale. It's always an honor and good to good to speak with you. Likewise, likewise, Brian. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today. And folks, you don't want to go anywhere because we've got the best practice awards and a lot of detailed information about future events coming up next. Stay with us. Well, that was pretty incredible. We had two gurus there, Dale Pollack, who is the authority on used vehicles in North America, and uh, and Brian Benstock at the same time. That was great. That was awesome. And Kara, welcome back. How's how's the day been for you? It's been hot here in Texas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's been hot here at the Fixed Ops Roundtable, The Matrix. And thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. Uh, Ted, we've still got um some voting that we can do i think right yeah okay if you haven't voted yet everybody here's your chance to finish up the voting for the best practice award winners uh gene can you put up that qr code I'm one last time do it right now i just put the uh, actual thing in the chat too so the link in the chat in case they don't have their camera but there is the qr code okay so either the link in the chat everybody you can click on that or take your phone open the camera and uh, vote uh now you can only vote once for the best practice word winners, Gene, is that right? That's right. Yeah. All right. So. And uh, for some reason, the, the system uh, allows, it's not supposed to, but it allows sometimes, we've had this in the past, for people to vote more than once. So I think we actually have more votes for some people than we actually have voters, which means, okay, something happened. <laughs> yeah, Kara, this happened once, I think back in October yeah. at the Tire Summit, we actually had somebody, Kara, receive more votes than there were people who voted <laughs> a substantial <laughs> amount more yeah. huh that's weird yeah. yeah right well we are on the matrix though so i guess anything is possible <laughs> <laughs> but we've noticed that anomaly today as well there's one per i won't even call it but right, uh, we we've we've received um someone has received more votes than there are voters so <laughs> interesting yes so we'll tally up the last ones here Everyone, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna check. Gene, give me a moment. I will check the uh, the tally, see what has changed. And sure. then uh, Kara, I will give you the names of the winners and I'll have you call them out. Okay. While, gotta... while you're finalizing that, let's just talk real briefly about our next show. There it is, it's Transformers. Now, I was trying to figure this out, Kara, while Ted is tallying up the, the final batch there. Um, you know, we, We've been able to do the theme thing and it's pretty easy to go on to amazon and get a um a neo outfit i don't know if i can get a transformers outfit i don't know if i can actually wear anything i don't know <laughs> what am i going to transform into <laughs> oh, my. oh boy you got three months to figure that out <laughs> <laughs> that's right but hey yeah folks we want you to join us at the fix ops round table uh transformers on thursday september 23rd so we're really excited about that event all the votes are, are in gene all the votes are in okay drum apparently it's not it's not if there are a few that's not gonna make a whole lot of difference at this point so uh cara i have uh, sent over the votes to you and hopefully you've received them and we'll have you call out the the top five no ties today cara no, no ties. Uh, no tie uh so we just have five winners so there you all go. righty all right, without further ado, what everybody's been waiting on today. All right, the fifth person we have here is fifth place. Dave. Okay. Yep, Dave Boy of Quantum Five. All right, Dave. Well one deserved, the, Dave. One Congratulations. Of the originals. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Good one job. of the founding fathers of the Fix Ops Roundtable. Right. right. So good job. Dave Boy. All right. And in fourth place, yep. Lamarque Ward. Woo. All right, my good buddy Lamarque. That's great. He'll he'll be thrilled to First hear that. Speaker of the day, yeah. So Dave Foy in fifth place and Lamarque Ward in fourth place. Good, great job. And great in job, third man. place, okay. Dave Versicle of Automotive News. Right on. First timer at the Fixed Stops Roundtable. What a great 
Kara and Gene, what a great panel, Dave Versicle led. That was an amazing panel. I mean, yeah. spiked a lot of interest and uh, fantastic all-star panel. One of the best ever. All right, and in second place, Dave Bouts of Cox Automotive. All right, that was a good one too. And hey, keynote for a reason, right? Yeah, yeah. So Dave Fouts at Cox Automotive, congratulations, second place on the Best Practice Awards. Again, we have Dave Foy from Quantum 5, Lamarque Ward, Dave Versicle from Automotive News, and Dave Fouts at Cox Automotive. So Kara, that leaves us with first place now. First place is Brian Kramer of Germain Toyota of Naples. Wow. Congratulations. Congratulations, Brian Kramer. Wow. Nice work. You know, that is incredible. Gene, they 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 said Brian Kramer should be on the fixed ops roundtable for months now. And he appeared on the last event as a panelist. And uh he did a magnificent job. So we invited him back. And uh I'm so glad he was able to hitchhike back from the the, of the conference <laughs> to make <laughs> <Yeah>. this. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, really. What a yeah. great job. That was awesome. All right. So our winners again, uh, Dave Foy, Lamarque Ward, Dave Versicle, David Fouts. Uh, three, of, three out of the five are Daves. Dave. <laughs> it's the day of the Dave. <laughs> yeah. Again, another Matrix thing. And uh, Brian Kramer of Jermaine Toyota of Naples coming in at That's first awesome. place. So That's congratulations awesome. to all the winners. That's awesome. Well, Ted, hey, just real quickly, if you're still here, um, and you want to watch the replay, give us about 10 days, seven to 10 days and search for us on YouTube and just type in the YouTube search fixed ops Roundtable, and you will find the videos. And we are so thankful. Kara, great job today. As always, thank you, Gene. thank you. And great and, job uh, to Gene. Hey, thank you. Yes. And we do have a closing video. Um, so, Anybody has anything else they'd like to say before we check out? Thank you all for being here. I'll see you on September 23rd. All right, man. <laughs> all right. See you awesome. then, everybody. See you later. Bye. Thanks, Kara. Thanks, Gene. Well, everyone, we made it out and on top, and Zion is safe once again. Hey, that's right, Keanu, and the automotive world is better off too. So on behalf of Cara, Gene, and Ted, I'm Ben Price, and until next time on the Fixed Ops Roundtable, thanks for watching.